That's Till Filter in afterwards. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming into a very small, very hot room to see my talk. Um, we'll go through the, the interesting part first. So this is me. I'm Keith Lerman. I've got a creative Twitter name that is easy to remember. Um, I graduated from Aberté a few years ago now. Um, I was only a bachelor's student, um, as we've learned over the past two weeks on Twitter. If you're not a PhD student in security, it's literally worthless, so thank you for all arriving anyway. Um, I spent the last six years at the same MSSP in a number of different roles. Um, started off as a SOC analyst, um, doing analysis work and helping build the blog ingestion. Um, with 4,000 clients, that's, you know, petabytes worth of blogs, so you had to learn fast. And at the moment, I am an IR first responder with the same um, MSSP. What I tell my mum I do is I'm a speed Googler. It's my um, credence that as long as you can Google faster than your client can ask questions, you're, you're set for life. <laughs> uh, this, this presentation was previously at Latour de Hack. Uh, this year in Edinburgh, it's a student-led conference by the Napier University. Um, if you were there and saw it, thanks for coming back for some reason. But that was a much shorter version of the talk. This is a more expanded one. And I've got a PowerPoint license now, so I can do that. <clears throat> so why um, have I decided to do a talk about Windows credential theft? So for people who are new to security or not in security, and hopefully a number of the people in the room fit that bill. Um, it's kind of an opaque wall. If in your TI reports that are commonly out, you get you know, a detailed paragraph on how they got in, a huge rundown paragraph on the you know, polymorphically encrypted modular malware that they have, and then there's a bit that says, then they did a Mimikatz, and then they go into the details of what they did with all the credentials they have. So I wanted to give some people a whirlwind tour on some of the details so they can fill in the blanks. So, Windows credential theft. It's basically the first priority for any major attacker landing on an infrastructure. You will tend to enter without the privileges you need to um, do what it is you want to do, your actions and objectives. For anyone who was in Peter's talk just before, he talked about this. It was very good, and I may repeat some of the things that he said. Um, in Windows, and this is a sort of key rule to remember throughout this entire presentation, is basically everything that happens in Windows is tied to a user account in Active Directory. Every user has an account. Every service that's running there is an account tied to that. Uh, even every individual machine has its own you know, stripped-down accounts. They all have domain accounts. Uh, so why do we need high privilege? So let's say you have got onto a network through phishing. You'll have a user account, most likely, whether that's local admin or not. It's not something that you can then use to pivot across the environment into every file server and retrieve what you want or to execute something like ransomware. So lateral movement is one of the key things that you need. The easiest way to move across the network is to have credentials to accounts that can travel across the network. Privilege escalation, you want to find accounts that have a higher privilege than where you landed. And one that's talked about less is persistence. You know, what, what better persistence is there on a network than having a username you can just log into? Um, so with all these things, why not just make a new account instead of fussing about trying to steal some? You, you need the access to create an account first, so you'd need to do the theft anyway. And also, for the most for the most part, account creation is logged by people a lot more than account usage. You know, you can see um, people with their syslog configs, where you know our logins looked at more thoroughly than account created, accounts added to domain admin, whichever. Um, so just a brief rundown on these accounts. Um, I'm going to split them into two. Firstly, local accounts, and secondly, domain accounts. So the local accounts are for a single machine and are stored on a single machine. So your work laptop, for example. 
I say ostensibly, I'll go into a little bit of detail on why I say that later. Uh, the details are all stored locally. It's hash-based authentications for a local logon. Um, before the NT kernel, so before I was born, uh, they used LM hashes. Now it's pretty much um, NT LM um, after the NT kernel, which I think was Windows 3 or 95, or one of the ones from way back. Um, these hashes are stored in the SAM registry hive, so that is Security Account Map. Yeah, Security Account Manager. Um, everyone just calls it SAM, so I forget what the acronym stands for sometimes. And that is encrypted with a value called syskey. Um, now, syskey is just a RC4 encryption key that encrypts a number of different uh, credential things in Windows, but it's also stored locally on <coughs> the machine. Um, when I was researching this before, Microsoft said that they are deprecating it, but in all of the official communications about deprecating it, they haven't really said what it's being replaced with. The, the, the official communications line says, you know, do full drive encryption with BitLocker, but that doesn't really solve the problem. And if your response is go use a third-party tool, that it's a bit defeatist, really. And there are a few built-in local accounts that are on every Windows machine. So those are administrator and guest. So guest is off by default since either Windows 7 or 8. I can't remember which. Anyone who uses XP will remember the little guest account at the bottom that nobody ever used. It's just a heavily stripped down account with very limited re um, access. And the default password's blank because the idea is anyone can use it. Uh, administrator has full control of the local resources and accounts. And since Windows 10, the actual administrator account is disabled by default once you um, <coughs> once you set up your machine. Your initial commands run under administrator in order to get your user account created. Then Windows disables its the default account and creates a new local admin. Um, local admins can be restricted from domain and network access um, since Windows 8.1, but um, you need to do that, so it often isn't. So just a little rundown on the hash authentication. I don't have any pens for the whiteboard, so I won't go into the explanation on why LM hashing is bad. But if you are starting out in um, understanding hashing protocols, I would look at LM hashing or examples of bad things. It's a good case study. It's not really used anywhere anymore since about 1993, but it's just a good case study to look at issues you can encounter. Um, and yeah, since, let's say, 1998, where the current NT values have come in, there's um, an MD4 algorithm to create a hash of the account. Um, and these are also partially encrypted with the syskey value I mentioned before. Uh, if you are looking at an NTLM hash in Windows, you will notice that there still is a slot for LM, but it's the same for everyone because it's disabled. But because of, you know, in classic Windows fashion, uh, to keep re re um, backwards compatibility with 1993, they still have the value in. Um, neither of these hash protocols um, have salts. Now, I know the theoretical idea is that any hashing without salting is useless, and while I can kind of agree, these are local accounts, so the salt would have to be stored locally. And if the salt's right next to the password hash, is it really an extra layer of security? So, when I am on my login screen, I type in um, my password or an input. Windows takes that, converts it with the same hashing protocol, and then compares it with what it has stored in the SAM hive. Um, now, LSAS, which is another acronym that I forget, Local Security Authority Subsystem Service, uh, LSAS.exe, it's part of the authentication process in Windows. For this purpose, the main thing is that it is the interface with um, SAM, the SAM hive. 
What that means is the hash ends up stored in the memory of LSAS. I'll come on to why that is an issue later on. Uh, locally, as I said, uh, win log onto exe is the process that actually does the comparison, but the hash is stored in LSAS instead. Other hashes do exist. These are weird niche things because Windows loves weird niche things from years past. Um, for example, TSPKG is authentication, like single sign-on authentication for the terminal services. Um, live SSP is stuff I could barely find any documentation for, for um, Windows Live, RIP. And WDigest, for some reason, is still around. It's LDAP authentication for server 2003. So a lot of old stuff. Now we come on to um, domain or remote accounts. These are the ones that are part of your Active Directory. I know I said to beginners, um, are we familiar with what Active Directory is in the room? Yes. Okay, so Active Directory, uh, there were some shakes of the head there. Active Directory is basically a number of services and a big database of all of the um, stuff within um, a Windows environment. So all your different computers in a work environment are all interconnected in some way. Active Directory is the database that manages the interactions and the services. Yes, so all authentication and permission handling. The main controllers are remote servers that handle all this authentication. So the services I mentioned are going to be interacting with these particular servers. It prefers the Kerberos protocol, which is another thing I'll get into in a little bit more detail when I'm talking about tickets. But there are cases where remote accounts will use um, NT hash as authentication. And that is if the server isn't in a domain, or doesn't have Active Directory set up, which you know, is going to be less useful for an attacker because if there isn't a domain, what are you attacking? And if a client connects to a server using an IP and no reverse DNS is available, it's not going to be able to find the um, domain controller, so it will attempt to use the hashes as a sort of fail failsafe. Um, the hash doesn't directly get sent over the wire. It uses some some math that's above my head, so I won't go into details. But it's essentially a random number that's sent. The hash doesn't go over. But the hash still gets loaded into LSAS if you're doing a interactive or login through RDP. Not for most network logins, though, since it doesn't go over the wire. Now, what other hashes are there on a machine? We've gone through some of the niche things and NT hashes. The other main ubiquitous ones are cached credentials. So computers aren't always connected to your domain. Every year I go to my mum's for Christmas and I have to work a couple of shifts there. That's not connected. When I first switch my computer on there, I'm not connected to my company's Active Directory, but my logon still works. That's because the last N user's details are cached locally on the machine itself. And by default, in local security options, 10 is the default. So the last 10 users' logins are cached in the registry of your laptop. And I mean, when you think about it, how many people are going to be logging into the average work laptop? The person who runs it, the admin who set it up, maybe a couple of help desk accounts. So for most places, you're never going to reach that 10. So you can think of it as everyone that logs into a work laptop likely has their credentials cached. Um, these are stored in the security hive, not SAM1, and they are stored as MS cache 2. It also is called DCC2. So it's not an NT hash. It's a different thing. They can't be used interchangeably. Uh, this one is salted, but it's salted with the account username. So again, it's not really something that's an extra layer of security. And these are all encrypted with a syskey. It's a recurring theme of credential hashes being encrypted with syskey value, even though you can just pull that out of the registry. Yeah, 
And those hashes, as I said, can't be used like anti-hashes. These ones, the only thing you can do with them is to crack them. Um, NTDS.dit, this is a big one. Um, so this is coming down to Kerberos authentication. This is the database file that is stored on the domain controller, as I mentioned. It's the keys to the kingdom, essentially, when it's Active Directory. All of the users and all of the hashes for that domain are stored in this database file because that's what the domain controller uses to compare your hash to ensure that you're, you are who you say you are. Um, yeah, so it's just, it's just a file on the machine stored in Windows slash NTDS slash NTDS dot dit. And it is both locked and protected by default. Every protection in the Windows Security API is applied to this, and it's constantly locked as in use, so you can't just control C it. And again, also encrypted with the syskey value. So those are the hashes. And now we're going to talk about how people actually steal them or retrieve them. Uh, so just a quick summary of the hashes and where they can be found. The SAM registry hive has the NT hashes of all your local users. The system registry hive has the syskey value that you're going to need to unstitch the hashes. Um, security slash cache hive has the MS cache 2 for cached credentials. And you've got ntds.dit, I just mentioned. And then you've got the memory of the LSAS process, which has those things. The NT hashes of all the users who logged in, which includes the remote accounts through interactive of RD or RDP logins, as I mentioned. Um, the syskey value, because it's loading syskey in to unstitch or unencrypt the hashes. And for some other of the niche hashes I mentioned, um, it can store the plain text passwords, which is really bad, but is less seen nowadays. So, SAM. Hashes are partially encrypted with syskey, so stealing the SAM file alone doesn't help. You need to also take the system hive to have the syskey to then work with it. The easiest way to do this is reg.exe. Peter mentioned it before as a common thing attackers use. It's built into Windows. Every single Windows machine has it. It's used legitimately for all registry um, manipulations, essentially. Um, yeah, default Windows executable for manipulating the registry. So this is, I'm just going to take a step back so I can see how big these pictures are on the screen. Yeah, they're perfectly readable. So there's some recon here. You can see where the SAM and the system hives are being stolen and the laser pointers just died. So I'm going to point with my finger. Um, we can see before they've stolen it, they've done two pretty standard recon attacks or recon steps. There's host name, which says what is the name of the host you're on. And you've got net user, which is essentially some details about what user you're logged in as at the moment. Um, then they steal the SAM and system files. Then if you notice, that's at 1017. An hour and a quarter later, at 11.32, they do net user test admin, which brings back some details about the test admin account. Now, they're not logged in as test admin, so they've found that account name out somehow. Most likely from the SAM file. And then once you've got the system of the SAM file, there are plenty of tools out there that will um, unpack it, unencrypt it and dump all the hashes out for you. PW dump is the most common one because it's built into Kali. So this was, um, I did a bit of credit for this picture. I think this was from Ultimate Windows Security, which is a very good website for Windows Security things. And if you are a SOC analyst, it's an absolute lifesaver when it comes to Windows event IDs. Um, if you notice that the first hash value is the same for every account there, that's what I mentioned before about the LM section always being present but not used. K 
cash credentials. It's much the same as stealing the SAM hive, except for me stealing the security hive instead. Um, and the system hive, same as before. But instead of PW dump, there are other tools such as cachedump.py. That's on GitHub somewhere. Mimicats also allows you to do this. And generally everything I say in this talk, you can basically append Mimicats also does this at the end, because at this point in time, it does everything. Um, so this one was shamelessly taken from one of the um, open SANS pages, because I couldn't find any live examples of cash credentials being stolen, because the majority of the time in instance I've seen, they've, be, they've been able to steal the credentials through much easier means than this. But it's good to still know about. Um, but as with the SAM, you're just taking system, security, you stick the things you've exported into the Python tool, it spits it out for you. mtds.dit, keys to the kingdom. As I said before, every Windows security API function is applying to this. It's locked as constantly in use, so you can't just copy it, you can't just move it or delete it or whatever you want with it. Um, you need both the SAM and the system hives to decrypt the file, even if you do manage to steal it. And you can't just copy it normally, as I said. One way to do it is with a malicious driver. So, um, Windows Security API is running at sort of operating system level. When you're using a driver, that's sort of one ring below, essentially, or multiple rings below, even. So you can use direct disk cast disk access to bypass all of these API protections. Uh, PowerSploit's the one that's most common for this, um, but I'm pretty sure most other post-exploitation frameworks are going to have a way of doing this as well. I don't actually see that very often because um, it's nowhere near as popular as NTDS NTDSutil, which is a Windows built-in sysadmin tool that allows you to access this file past the um, security protections. Um, another recurring theme is that if Windows have put in a protection, then there's a significant chance that they'll have also created an admin tool to bypass all the protections that they've just implemented. So I put this in as an example of a real world case where the NTDS file was stolen. Unfortunately, I can't remember what the arguments mean, but that's the ACI NTDS and the IFM are the way that attack are the options that the attacker uses to take it out. I just can't remember what they stand for. Um, the other way is volume shadows. So if you've ever restored a machine from, say, you've messed up a Windows update or Windows has messed up a Windows update and you're refreshing from before the update, that's a volume shadow copy. It's just a backup of your machine from a previous point in time. So if your NTDS file is locked as always in use, why not just steal one of the backups and take it from there, where it isn't in use? And this is probably the second most common I've seen. You've got here where they have just taken the latest shadow copy, shadow copy one, taken and just copied the NTDS file out of it into Windows 10. And then you've got a copy of it, you can export to your own machine and do whatever cracking you want. And LSAS.exe, this is one of the very common credential theft methods. So I mentioned a number of things that are stored in the memory of this process. Um, one way to get at that is to dump the memory of that process through various debugging methods. Then you've just got a big chunk of memory that has your hashes stored in it, or even plain text passwords sometimes. There's many tools to do this, um, open source ones. There's about four or five in Kali, I think. Proc dump's the most common. It was, a lot of people say it was built by Microsoft, but um, another classic Microsoft trick. Someone else built it, so they hired that person. Now it's Microsoft's. Um, that goes for the entire sys internal suite. Um, it's very simple. You say proc dump, you point it at LSAS, you give it a file name, and then you accept the ELA because we're all good. 
we're, we're all good threat actors who accept the terms and conditions. But there are other methods that are coming into use because um, pointing sysinternals tools at LSAS, even if you rename them, it's getting very easy to detect, really. Um, Comservices.dll is another built-in thing into Windows. This is a DLL that contains various functions for running com objects, usually custom com objects. There's basically no documentation about this in any Microsoft site anywhere. So when it turned out to have a function in it called minidump that just dumped the memory of any process with, and you don't even need to install sysinternals tools to get at that. It's on every machine by default. <coughs> um, it became very common starting the end. Of, I first saw it at the start of the end of 2019, around September. Then it was kind of quiet for a few months. And then starting 2020, basically every exp every compromise was using this instead of proc dump. Um, there are actually other things that are built into Windows as well. It seems every few weeks somebody finds a new debugging tool for .NET or something that's built into Windows that has the functionality to dump memory. So there's a lot of different ways to do it now. Those are just the two most common at the moment. But if you don't want to dump the process memory and you have the privilege to do so, you can just read it live from the process. Um, this is what Mimikatz traditionally does. So in your reports where it says, you know, they did a Mimikatz, it's most likely them talking about reading the credentials out of LSAS while it's running live. But there are some other cases. Um, WCE, Windows Credential Editor, and um, if you're listening to this presentation in 2008, there's PW Dump 6 as well. So the two places you can read it live from, um, at Ring 3, the sort of regular user level, if you have the SE debug privilege in your security token or in your logon, then, you know, uh, admin accounts can grant you that. Then you can just open the process as a debugger. Um, and as Ring 0, you can use a driver to directly access the memory. And that's similar to the NTDS thing where it gets around a lot of the security API functionality. And here's an example from... Uh, as you can see, it's been two years since I took this, two and a half years. But it's run DLL32, so I'm almost 100% sure that's Cobalt Strike, because they love injecting into a, a new copy of run DLL32. And that's um, an injection live into LSAS. That's the Ring 3 thing I was talking about. They've opened it up as a debugger, and you can see that it's reading memory from um, injecting memory into it that just has a little memory reader that they're sticking in. Uh, now, I mentioned that some other authentication types are storing stuff as plain text in LSAS. Now, I mentioned the three things at three other hash types at the start, WDigest, Terminal Services, and Live SSP, because those are the uh, culprits in this case. You'll notice that um, they say pre-2017 there. That's because in that KB patch in September 2017, all those clear text things were removed from LSAS, except WDigest, because people still use Server 2003. But the same patch introduced a registry value that says, do you want to use WDigest, which is good. You know, it's zero by default, so by default, nobody's using WDigest. Unfortunately, attackers realize they can just flick that zero to a one, and everyone starts using WDigest again. So you've got all your plain text in LSAS once more. That's a bit of an inconvenience for the attacker because once they do that, they then need to wait for people to log in to get those things put into LSAS. But really for most attackers, they've got nothing but time once they're in the environment. Now, I do want to apologize to whoever made this because I did have credit for it before, but when moving from one computer to another computer, it doesn't have the credit on it anymore. But this is essentially a summary in table format of what 
things are stored in Elsass's memory in which operating system. Um, so, yeah, apologies to whoever it was. I accidentally cut the bottom of the QR code off. And I'll move on. So what now? We have, I've talked about taking the hashes, but what do we actually do with them once we have them? We have the hashes, we don't have the clear text password, so what can we do? There's a smorgasbord, I like that word, of various hash cracking tools out there. There's at least three in Kali alone. GitHub probably has infinite more. John the Ripper, Hashcat, Kane and Abel are classics from various points in history. They all still work because NT hasn't really changed that much. Um, it's mostly rainbow table based cracking because that's the quickest way to deal with um, unsalted hashes. Uh, but yeah, that won't work on MS Cache 2. But cracking hashes is a lot of effort and chances are you're relying on privileged accounts having bad passwords to get your hash cracked nice and quickly. It is a lot of effort. But if you think about how hash-based authentication works, you put your input into the logon screen, it hashes that, and sends it to Samhive, which has the hash in it. Neither side of this equation is using clear text passwords in any way. And it's just verifying the hash. And we have the hash. So do we really need to get the clear text password out there? Uh, the answer is no with the pretty common attack called pass the hash. Now, this takes advantage of single sign-on authentication. Um, if I am logging into a machine, or I don't want to have to log in again for every action I take on that machine remotely. So you enter the password once, and then for every new interaction, you don't need to re-authenticate. That's because um, every logon and every process has a access token assigned to it. So when you log in, it gives you a token that says this person has already authenticated, that's who they are. So if we have the hash, the token has the username and the hash in it to say this is who they say they are. But if we have the hash and we know the username, then we can create a new process and then just forge an authentication token to say, this is the username, stick the hash in. We don't know what the password is, but we don't need it because we've made the token that says we've already authenticated. So you just map this forged token to the new process you've created. So it's small on my screen, so I'm going to have to take a step out to point at it. Um, this is invoke Mimikatz, which is kind of just running Mimikatz in memory from the Powerline um, post exploitation framework. We can see that it is doing PTH, which is past the hash. All you're doing is pointing the username, pointing the domain you're attacking, and this is the already stolen NTLM hash. And really, after that, you have the token that says, I have um, access to be this user. Um, and there's some privileged debug stuff there that probably doesn't make sense until the slides after this. So I'll go back in a second. Um, so tokens, which I mentioned. Every login and process gets a security token saying who they are, what um, security context they have, and what privileges they have. So that happens when you log in, and then other privileges can be assigned to you afterwards that will update your token. There are two important types of token to think about, as well as just the ones that say who you are. Impersonate and delegate. Um, to have either of these assigned to you, you need to have this privilege, but any admin account can do it, and any admin account can also add this privilege to your normal account as well. So if you already have the access, you can just give it to yourself. So it's not a huge roadblock. The impersonate token allows you to um, essentially shift your token locally. It allows you to impersonate another account 
on your local machine. Delegate is basically the same thing, but across the network, not just on your one host. Um, one important thing to know about tokens is they only exist during your login session. Once you log out, they get um, cleaned away by the operating system, which is, again, not a huge roadblock for an attacker, but it will put some um, time into their playbook because they may need to, once they get onto a host and have the ability to steal tokens, they may have to wait for whoever they want to steal the token from to log in for it to appear. Um, I didn't put it in the slide, but one of the most common things, problems I see with tokens is RDP logons. So if you remotely log into um, a machine with RDP and you press the X button when you're done, that doesn't, that doesn't log you out. That doesn't close your connection. That just shuts the screen. You're still logged in on the machine, which means your token still exists. So if you're an admin and you don't log out when you're done, you just close it that admin token is still sitting on the machine for however long. Um, Microsoft kind of wised up to how many people were forgetting to log out. So there's now a default expiry time. So if you your RDP session hasn't been used in X amount of time, it logs you out by default. Pretty much, pretty much solely to avoid this issue. Um, yeah, so that's just... Uh, picture of it. I'll go back to this because we have privilege debug. This is the um, essentially giving you the access after you've um, done past the hash to um, assigning the debug privilege to the token that they've just created. So that's then what they're going to use for it. It's a bit mind-boggling if this is your first step into it, but think of it as a chain of actions. They've passed the hash to um, get into a user account, and then they are assigning new um, privileges to the token they've just created. Um, now tickets. Kerberos, the other authentication method. So. This is going to be a whirlwind th tour through Kerberos because about three people in the world fully understand Kerberos and two of them are retired. So the idea is that your red bit at the start is first. I want to access services on server B. I reach out to the domain controller for an authentication request to say, I am Keith. It then verifies me with the TGS. It's sort of hash-based authentication between you and the domain controller. If all is good, it gives you a ticket granting ticket, the TGT from here on out. Then I send the TGT off to the domain controller saying, I want this service from server B. The domain controller then works out whether you have the permissions to ha access that service. Once it uh, approves you, it gives you the approval back and you can then use that approval with server B and do whatever it is you want to do. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go into the details of the encryption behind it because I'm already 40 minutes in and I don't want to do maths. So your TGT that you've just been assigned by the domain controller lives for 10 hours by default. That's the default group policy um, thing. So for 10 hours after you have been authenticated by the domain controller, it's going to allow you to request access to services from the domain controller. Access, yeah, access to the ticket means you are pre-authenticated as that user. So these tickets are stored in LSAS memory until that ticket expires, at which point they're cleaned away. And even if you could steal them, you don't want to. You can't use them. You have a similar attack to um, pass the hash, which is pass the ticket, where, you know, you can steal the um, Kerberos ticket out of LSAS, and since you're pre-authenticated, you can just use that ticket you've taken to say, I'm already authenticated, don't bother asking me any questions. But that means you can impersonate one user for 10 hours, which it isn't really that impressive. I'm sure we can do better than that.
So, Kerber Roasting. Any domain user can request access to a server, essentially, because that yellow chunk of the authentication process is where the permissions were actually verified whether you should have access to that service. You're still requesting the TGT first. So any user can request any service. The TGT has a non-salted password hash for the service account in it that you're trying to request. So you are getting back a hash for the server service account. Um, when requesting the ticket, there is an option in it that allows you to request which cipher that hash is you know, basically encrypted with, which includes RC4, which is pretty well broken at this time. Um, so if you can take that ticket and you can take the details out of the ticket onto your own machine, you can essentially perform a brute force on the account because you're offline. There's no restrictions on how many attempts you can have. You know, if I was trying to do a login screen, it would lock me out after five attempts. If I take it from here, I can stick whatever rig I want to blitz through it. And service accounts. Remember at the start I said every action Windows is tied to a service. That includes all your services. So if I have an account called SVC 0365 Automations, all the Office 365 Automations are probably running under that service account. And they're usually high privilege because maybe we've got multiple Office 365 servers. That would take a lot of effort to, you know, locally handle the authentication for all of them. So just make the service account domain admin. it will be fine. And yeah, compared to um, your user accounts, they're usually not really paid attention to because nobody theoretically owns them. Whoever runs the service owns them, but they've got their user accounts to deal with. And Golden Ticket is the logical conclusion of this chain of thought. So any action is tied to an account. Any service is tied to a service account. KRB TGT is the service account on pretty much every, the default service account for all Active Directory domains that handles the creation of TGT. That is a service, therefore it has an account. So if we take the password of that, and then you crack it through Kerberos thing, or if you steal NTDS, that has the password for everyone, that has the hash for everyone, including all the service accounts, you then have access to the account that creates the authentication tickets. So you can make tickets for any account as you want that gives you pre-authentication. And um, I mentioned that there are 10 hours by default, but since you can create the tickets, just make it 20 years. Why not? Domain admin, 20 years. Windows isn't going to even blink an eye. Just creates it, gives it to you. Um, <laughs> and, and there you go. We've had cases where um, we've evicted, a, well, someone has attempted to evict the attacker and they've just logged straight back in because they've still got a 20 year old, a 20 year lasting TGT ticket. So we've, we've kicked the attacker out. They've, they're still technically logged in. So they just come right back. And yeah, if admin access is lost because the um, victim twigs, then you've still got the ticket that's valid and you just do pass the ticket to get back in and get your claws stuck into the network again. So those are a variety of details. And now I'm going to try and zoom in with a touchpad as opposed to the mouse that I forgot to bring. So this is an example of a number of steps from a genuine, I think this was ransomware that came in through a VMware view server. So let's go to the start. Here we have my laser pointer. Oh, it doesn't allow me to do a laser pointer. So we have a reverse shell built in node here. That's the first thing that comes out of the exploit. So the first thing that they do, they spin up CMD, that's the reverse shell. They run um, a PowerShell command that's base64 encoded. That command decodes to get AD computer filter star sort. 
find out details about what accounts are around me in the network or what computers are around me in the network. Second, IP config slash all. What are the interface details of the machine I'm on? Q user. Um, Q user, I think that's working out information about either what user you're logged in as or all of the users that are logged in at that time. I forget which. Either way, it's reconnaissance understanding what's on the machine I've just accessed. <laughs> It must be um, all accounts that are logged in because the next step is that they do net user VM user to see this one sounds interesting. What permissions does it have? Funnily enough, VM user was a domain admin. So everything from now on, they've picked their targets. We have PowerShell. I've um, redacted the attacker's IP there because they did exfiltrate a lot of information to it. And while I'd hope that, you know, Five months later, it's gone. It might not. So under the risk of any of you trying to log into the attacker's infrastructure to steal the data, it's all redacted. So they downloaded pc.exe from a remote source. Now, that one is Procdump. They eventually did it through ngrok the first time it was blocked by Windows Defender. But we then see down here Procdump being pointed at LSAS. Classic. Then, um, similar to Peter was showing in the last talk, the um, attacker has then downloaded WinSCP, just a bog standard file transfer executable, to take that LSAS.dump and stick it on um, an FTP server under the username coolbool20 with some password that I can't remember, but it was um, equally... <laughs> Strange choice of password. Now, you have um, secretsdump.exe, which is pulling um, LSA secrets out of stuff that they have, the um, machine that they have taken. This one failed a number of times to download, but eventually they landed... Eventually, they did get um, sec.exe onto the machine. And this is where they're doing <coughs> the hash. We can see that they've stolen the hash of VM user from the LSAS dump. Um, that's 2241. And then they used the hash at 2249. It wasn't a very good password. But really, that's kind of showing that that's just over eight minutes they've taken from stealing the LSAS memory dump to having the hash of the end user. Then what else did they do? Yeah, they, uh, I think Windows Defender stumped their pass the hash attempt for a couple of tries until they downloaded a different tool instead, um, invoke WMI exec and did pass the hash from that instead. I can't remember which post-exploitation framework that is. It's a different one from um, Impacket, though. I think it's PowerSploit or PowerLine, maybe. That's me forgetting which. Um, but yeah, you can see there that they were successful because they stopped attempting anything else. And then they are just doing net group domain admins. Once they have a domain admin access to the um, domain controller, uh, that's that's where they're logging into. The 192.168.16.30 was the domain controller. And once they've got access to that, they have the permissions to steal the NTDS file. And they're just using domain, the net group domain admins to find all the other <coughs> targets that they then want to steal the hashes of. Um, now, what I would like to point out is... Where's the start? Yes, so that command shell was spun up at 22.24.56. That last command was 22.53.28. So that was 25 minutes between exploiting a VMware view server and having domain admin on the domain controller. So these are... Peter said it best in the last one that 
attackers have people they outsource to that are just running scripts. The Conti group leak was a great example of that. There's just playbooks they're following. All this stuff is stuff you could give to essentially anyone that can follow a PDF. It's just find users that are logged in, see if any of them have an interesting name, work out if they're a domain admin. If yes, follow these instructions, take the hash, go to the domain controller. So there, <laughs> this is very much, well, let me get rid of the laser pointer. It was useless. Um, it's very much a simple process that can be done very easily. Um, this is a world winter of the basics, really. It's far from an all-inclusive list. There are other ways of taking things. Um, I'm just going to briefly run down some of them. DC Sync is the other most common one. Most domains have multiple domain controllers. It's simple networking policy. You want redundancy. If one domain controller goes down, you've got one as a backup. Um, but that means if I change my password, then it's only going to change the password on one domain controller. They need to have a way of syncing up between each other. So DC syncing is regularly, or if you manually request it, they will, um, the most recently changed domain controller will send a copy of the um, stuff it needs to the other domain controller. Um, if you have the NT hash of a domain controller machine account, you can say, hey, I'm a domain controller. Can I sync, please? And it will just fling you the most recent copy of the um, NTTS or a uh, most recent copy of the AD database. And then there's Active Directory exploits, which there's been more of recently. Um, zero logon was a net logon vulnerability that allowed you to reset arbitrary machine account, that allowed you to reset arbitrary passwords. So people were resetting the DC machine account passwords so they could log in as the domain controller and DC sync. No pack. Um, this one specifically was mentioned by Peter as actively exploited. There's Kerberos ticket shenanigans that allowed you to say, hey, I am this domain controller, give me a ticket. And then you could log in as the domain controller machine account and easy sync. Um, and then there was a, mo a more recent one, Digi Certificate Services. And I'm not sure I'm going to have time to go through this one, so... Yeah, if you're interested in that one, ask me afterwards, because I'm just going to skip the mitigations part of this. That was a, if I had time, I'll go through it. So, mitigations. Let's start at XP, because lots of people still say that's the best um, operating system of all time. It was bad for a credential safety. Like, really bad. It had WDigest on by default, so plain text was in LSAS. Um, your service accounts were essentially running as system which is the highest level of local account privilege because th there wasn't any other account for them to log in as. There was guest and everything and nothing in between. Um, Windows 7 tried to move to a sort of least privilege model where everyone's running with the least amount of privilege they need. Uh, user access control, I'm sure everyone recognizes that window. Basically, if you are an admin account, if you log in, you aren't logged in as an admin. You are logged in under user privileges and permissions until you need an admin permission, at which point it says, do you really want this process to use admin? And then everyone clicks yes anyway. And there were some new built-in identities, interactive and local service. And that's for services to get around them all running a system they created local service for service accounts to run as without being an admin. Windows 8 and 8.1, you'll notice they didn't really say much about Windows 7 there because all the best things from Windows 7 when it came to credential safety started in 8.1 and they then backported them. This was really good. This was the first major step of credential safety. Um, single sign-on things were no longer cached in LSAS by default. That was the 2017 patch I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, you can still switch them on. Eh, attackers can do that, but it being off by default way better than nothing. 
Uh, local accounts can be restricted from network logins. So, you know, if you steal um, local account hashes, you can't then just log into remote hosts with that local information. And there is protected processes, which seems almost explicitly made for LSAS. Um, only signed libraries and other protected processes can attach to LSAS. So even if you have the debug privileges needed, you need to be signed or protected to do so. So that got rid of a lot of the, um, a, a number of the Mimikatz and lesser known credential thumping tools. Unfortunately, this is off by default, and Mimikatz got signed driver almost immediately, so you can still just mim Mimikatz. And then there was restricted admin in RDP, which essentially, if this is switched on, then RDP connections from an admin account will explicitly not cache credentials or tickets or um, store hash details in LSAS. Um, <laughs> this was switched on by default, but the only way for them to stop tickets being cached was to say, okay, if it's restricted, we'll use NT authentication, which then meant you could just do pass the hash attacks on the admins instead of pass the ticket. So they kind of threw their arms up in the air and switched that protection off by default. Um... They also added Domain Protected Users, which um, was a new security group for high-value accounts, so your domain admins and stuff. And similar to the last thing, they basically strengthen credential protections for anything under this group. So you just want to stick all your domain admins and domain service accounts under this. It can't use any weak authentication, so NTLM hashes are done. You can't do patch the hash past the hash because it doesn't allow you to um, use NTLM authentication. It's only Kerberos. Credentials are never cached. Tokens can't be delegated, etc. Um, but because you're not caching any credentials, it means that if your, um, your domain controller goes offline or the server that you want to log into isn't connected to the internet, none of the credentials are cached, so they can't log in. <coughs> So that's really a case of security versus functionality, which I think we all know how that ends up. Uh, Windows 10 was another good one. Not as big a step, but a lot of decent things added. Um, credential guard. So LSAS is no longer um, just unexecutable if you have this switched on. It uses Hyper-V for machine virtualization, so um, part of the authentication process is essentially stuck in our own little virtual box that only ELSA ISO can communicate with, so it's really restricting the access. Um, unfortunately, Mimikatz found a way around this as well. Um, there is the mitigation that you can only take the hashes of accounts that log in after you have run the Mimikatz function. So it is affecting it a bit. You can still steal the hashes, but it's a lot more inconvenient. So it's still very good. Uh, remote Credential Guard is basically restricted admin, but works better. But really, the what you want, the best defense, is basic hygiene, you know? Wash your hands, clean your teeth. Don't interactively log into a user laptop as domain admin. That's a recipe for a bad time because you can't really control. Most attackers are going to land on user laptops first if they're not using an exploit on a server. Um, PowerShell administration doesn't send credentials, so don't use RDP. If you need to log into a user laptop as domain admin, use one of the particular methods that doesn't send that information over the wire. And, um, you know, the credential guard things I just mentioned also work. Um, as Windows 7 tried, you want a policy of lowest required privilege. You know, don't... If, if your users... Most of your users don't need local admin. Why are so many companies giving everyone local admin permissions on their machine? Why are you checking your emails as an admin? Why are you... Browsing Facebook with admin permissions. 
Um, terminate RDP connections when finished. Don't just drop. I covered those a little bit before. Um, keep long passwords, particularly on your service accounts. You're monitoring your user accounts more thoroughly than your service accounts, usually, because that's just how it works. Service accounts are used everywhere a lot of the time. Um, and yeah, while Microsoft stopped their guidelines saying that you should reset user account passwords regularly, it's still worth changing your service account passwords regularly. There's a lot less inconvenience in doing that than changing user account passwords. And the classic, easier said than done, monitor for anomalous activity. What's anomalous activity? If you can answer that, you've solved security, essentially. But um, if you're seeing a lot of TGT requests from a single account, it's not usually um, normal behavior for anyone. Um, especially if they're being requested with um, abnormal ciphers, RC4 in particular. Usually means somebody's trying to curb roost everything that they can. Um, yeah, workstation to workstation communications. How many times in your daily work do you log into a server? How many times in your daily work do you log into someone else's laptop? One's a lot more likely than the other. And yeah, keep an eye on your domain controllers for what they're doing. And if you have EDRs and you only have a limited number of licenses, make sure you put them on your domain controller first. There's so many incident response cases I've had where we've got perfect coverage of the user laptop and we see them. Actually, the VMware review one I had before, um, note that none of the commands I put there were on the domain controller because they put their EDR on the view server but not on any of the domain controllers. So everything was out of sight that happened after that. Uh, it's already past an hour. That is the break next. Yes. So you want to wrap up or is there any questions? Yeah. I'm just saying that, you know, I don't know how important the break is. So does anyone have any questions? There's one. So you said that what about Um, I don't believe so. I don't think so. There's less documentation on that because the um, the hashes are much more of a target from attackers because you can use those in pass the tick pass the hash attacks. You don't need to then take it offline and crack them yourself to get a plain text password. So. The number of attacks I can, the number of, you know, intrusions I can say I've seen that um, attacked hashes, countless. The number I can say that properly attacked cached credentials as their way of really getting anything, zero. I think I've seen one that actually attempted it, but zero otherwise. Yes. Uh, are there any monitoring systems that are uh, talking about anomalous things happening that can actually maybe machine learning can learn what's anomalous and have those running on your system so you can slowly train them and go, oh, this anomalous thing happened, please learn or look at it. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of them, and what I'll say is your mileage may vary. And by may, I mean will. Yeah. Some are better than others, but... Yeah, but really, it also depends on your environment, because Windows does a lot of weird stuff. Like, if if you go through a security course and find, um, like, hard rules, even in SANS from people who've been doing it for years, they'll say something like, you know, <coughs> there shouldn't be any process spawning out of LSAS. There should never be a child process of LSAS. As part of my job, I've got access to... Um, you know, the EDR telemetry from 4,000 clients. So I went, okay, let's see how many child processes we have of LSAS over the last two days. And the answer was 800,000. So <laughs> for every rule, there is an exception. And unfortunately, that goes for anomalous activity too. You, these tools really depend on how good they are at determining normal. And even then, there's a lot of cases where... Each company could train normal over time. Yeah. But unfortunately, there's also a lot of case. You'll get a lot of false positives from it because people do weird things. Sysadmins do even weirder things, and there's no and there's no documentation on half of Microsoft, so it's an um, uncomprehendable black box at times. But 
if someone can get that, then they've cracked a lot of the Windows detection side of security. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. But if you have enough people to go through the false positives, it's definitely worth trying. Even an alert. Yeah. If you have enough, if you have enough resources and manpower to go through these false positives and then tune out the noisy ones, then it's a it is a good standpoint. But anyone who's thinking of it needs to understand there will be a lot of like work involved in any of these anomalous detection things. Yes, yes. Um, maybe less for the specifically for the things I've mentioned here, but just generally, um, when you've got Sysmon, if you enable things like command line monitoring for your process creation Windows events, um, that's going to catch a good amount of the process telemetry I've pointed out here before. Um, the process telemetry there is an EDR that I use at my company. So that's nothing particularly Windows related. It's just something we have installed on these hosts. But Sysmon, Sysmon is Sysmon's good if you think of it as an EDR light that it's going to... Um, It's like getting an EDR that doesn't have any signatures. Another th it's another thing that if you're enabling Sysmon, you need to have someone trained to actually understand what the output's going to be. And a lot of companies don't want to put the you know investment into that because it is expensive and it's hard to get the talent. Any other questions or? Yeah, you talked about Cisco a bit. Do you think the Replacement for Syskey might relate to the requirement now for TPM 2.0. The what, sorry? The replacement that they might have for Syskey. Do you think it might relate to the TPM 2.0 requirement for Windows? Um, it may do. It's not something I've looked at. I'm not sure whether you could... There's no real information on what... Yeah, I'm not sure you could replicate the functionality one-to-one -one with the TPM. Uh, the question was... Um, would the replacement for syskey be related to TPM 2.0 in Windows? Um, I'm not sure you could replicate the functionality one-to-one, -one, but it's definitely a chance that they're filling some of the gap. Yeah, because it doesn't clear benefits of the TPM. But yeah. Why they've gone so far to enforce it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but as, as as you say, you've come to the classic Microsoft trap of this is what I think might be the case, but there's no documentation for it anywhere. Of course. Yeah. I do like Microsoft. It's my favorite operating system. I mean, I like Linux too, and I'll be happy to use it when it's finished. But... <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.